And all right. So I thought it would be fun to start with a bit of a comic strip. Give you a second to read this. So the, the 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 question behind this is is uh, you know how believable are the numbers that you're taking a look at when you're looking at visualizations? Are they just numbers that are made up, or is there some context behind the numbers? Did they come from some kind of a reliable source, or were they just just completely completely made up? Um, a real world story along these lines came from one of my customers back in the United States. Uh, they operate an, an airline that services a bunch of small cities in the Pacific Northwest. And um, one of the uh, gate agents at one of these remote cities called up IT one afternoon and said, you know, help, my application that I use to, to properly balance the, the aircraft and put passengers and baggage in the right parts of the aircraft is broken. It's not working anymore. And um, the guy in IT got a little bit worried, and his next question was, well, what weight and balance application are you talking about? We don't have one. And the guy said, well, sure, we have that Excel application that I got from Frank down in Portland. And at that point, they stopped flying airplanes for a few hours while they figured out whether or not all of the planes were loaded using this spreadsheet or were they loaded using whatever the proper tools were for making sure that planes were accurately loaded so that this kind of thing doesn't happen. And for those of you that don't know about airplanes, when they're not loaded correctly, they do tend to just fall right out of the sky. So the lesson there, again, is this this tool that has a mission-critical context. Indeed, it's got a kind of a life-saving context to it, right? But it was something that was built at a grassroots level. And so there's this this disconnect that sometimes exists between what the enterprise needs and what the end users are coming up with. And you'll hear it in terms of numbers that aren't necessarily believable, or you'll hear it in terms of a system that suddenly broke that wasn't supposed to be broken. And that's what I want to talk about today. My name's Kurt Budd. I'm a sales consultant with Tableau. Um, I've been doing this kind of stuff for my entire career, helping companies implement business intelligence and data warehousing systems that have some proper enterprise context so that the numbers are believable and that they can be trusted and that they can be used in a proper enterprise context. And 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 that's what we're talking about. So the the the, the question to kind of get this started, or a series of questions that are worth asking, are, are questions like these, right? How many people have competing definitions of business terms? I sat in a meeting, there you go, this one. I sat in a meeting, uh, this is another real real world story, uh, when I was implementing a system for visibility into a bunch of projects for a large um, capital engineering company. There were 11 people in the room, and we had 13 different definitions of what a project was. Right? So there's no consistency in the data, so that frequently something that comes up. How many people have got loads and loads and loads of desktop applications out there and there's some concern over whether or not the tables are correctly joined and consistently joined so that everybody's getting the same results from the database? Another one that commonly comes up, this happened with a customer of mine in, in uh, Chicago. There were dozens of extracts that were almost completely identical. In, in fact, there was a customer at Tableau just this last week that had somewhere between four and 600 separate extracts, according to the email that I saw. I'm willing to bet that many of those were just duplicates, and perhaps we could get by with fewer extracts that, that were useful across a large number of people inside the organization. Sometimes we end up with situations where customers struggle with making sure that we get the right desktop uh, database middleware deployed on a number of different machines. This gets to be really troublesome in scenarios where you have locked down desktop computers and people can't install things on their computers at will. And it makes Tableau difficult to use if the end users can't get connected to the databases that they need. Um, I've seen lots of customers that are really, really focused on 
database security and implement all of the database middleware that's there, the encrypt communication between the client and the server, and they set all of this wonderful stuff up, and then they go and they dump the data into Excel and let people query Excel and clear text. So if security is something you're really important about, the capabilities that we'll be getting through in this, in this session today are, um, are relevant. And then the last one around data security, making sure that people get the right rows of data depending on who they are in the organization. These are all things that we resolve through the use of one specific capability in Tableau Server, it's called the data server. And so that's what we're going to be talking about and, and demonstrating today. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit architecturally about what it is, then uh, do a, a, a bit of a demo of it. We'll kind of go in and out of a couple of different end user scenarios, seeing what this data server looks like. And then I'll wrap up with some information on where you can go to get some, uh, some additional knowledge and, and resources that might be relevant. To get started, um, thinking about where this data server sits and what it looks like, um, let's think about this from the perspective of a, an architect who's responsible for making data available for someone to be able to consume. So this person isn't necessarily interested in building any dashboards, him or herself. This person simply wants to make data available. And, and as you know, uh, using Tableau Desktop, this person can get connected to any one of those databases that you see over there on the left. Right? We've all seen Tableau Desktop, and you can see the connection screen that lets you go get connected to all sorts of different databases. What you do as the architect, then, is you establish that connection. You identify the tables that are of interest. You can do all the wonderful things that we do with the, the metadata to make it usable for the business user audience. And then when you're finished with that, you can publish that to one of the components inside Tableau Server called the data server. I don't publish any data. The only thing I've published is some semantics, some information about how to go get some data. So the data server is just a place that hosts some instructions on how to go and get the stuff that you would really want. And Tableau Server also has this option of storing some of that data. It's a bit of a misnomer that the, the data extract, if you choose to use it, technically doesn't sit inside this data server process, but for the purposes of this diagram, it's, it's accurate enough. But in this scenario, you can lift some of the data out of the source systems and, and drop it into this Tableau data server if you so too. It would be transparent to the end users. They wouldn't notice one or the other. Um, Tableau Server provides all the security and management infrastructure that's necessary to make this work in the enterprise. And so we have components that will make sure that the right end users can see the right sections of data within this set of semantics that we've published. And we also have inside here the, the management and automation tools that are necessary when we want to try and produce a, uh, a refresh of that data extract on, on a schedule basis. So all of this is stuff that gets done by an architect. There's no visualizations of any data yet. This is all just purely initializing things, making data available for other people to consume. So along comes another persona, somebody who's interested in viewing some of this data. So this end user with Tableau Desktop, rather than connecting directly to a backend database, they can connect to um, they can connect to Tableau Server, and then from Tableau Server they can uh, do what they need to do. So the end user is interested in getting connected to the data. They can do so by connecting not directly but through Tableau Server, and as this image suggests, they can produce some some dashboards that they ultimately might decide that they want to publish into the Tableau server environment, whereby those visualizations become available for loads of other people to consume through browsers or tablet devices, computers, whatever, any kind of a browser device. So what we're getting at in this presentation is really all about that, the, the, the interplay between what the first person does, building a visualization or building a set of semantics and then how that impacts everybody else in this picture. So what we're going to do for um, 
the next few minutes is actually walk through some scenarios with the tool, constructing some, some metadata, if you will, constructing what we call a data source, publishing it to data server, and then seeing how that gets consumed by others inside the organization. So let's just go to it. Um, here I am inside Tableau Desktop, and in fact, I've already made a connection to a database, right? I've, I've just gone and, and connected to a, a SQL Server database and started to identify the joins that somebody might be interested in working with. Um, if we take a look at this particular data source, you'll notice that there's, there's loads of columns that I've made a decision to hide. There's a bunch of things that I don't think the end user needs to be bothered with. And so I'm just going to hide a bunch of columns, right? I just did that the wrong way. Um, you can also notice that we've done some things like creating a hierarchy here. Any number of different hierarchies could be created to enable some drill paths for the end users as they're interacting with some of this data. Um, here's another example of some metadata. You can create nice descriptions of each of the columns so that as an end user starts to create new visualizations, they get a little bit more uh, verbose information about what this column means, what's, what's, what's the meaning behind this thing. And the last example that I set up in this is um, just, a, just a simple formula that calculates some kind of a, some kind of a ratio, a profit ratio. So these are all things that I've decided are, are relevant and useful for my end users. And I want them to be uh, to be available for use. And so, if I wanted, just as a, a as a quick test, I could prove to myself that things these things do in fact work. So here I've got an example of of a hierarchy and drilling through the hierarchy. I can see uh, profit margins for for different portions of the, of the product category. But in truth, I'm really not that worried about the visualization themselves. I'm just the architect. I'm interested in making sure that this data is available for somebody else to consume. And all I need to do is tell Tableau that I want to publish this data source. So if I take this and I publish it to server, let's do this as this user. When you're publishing something to Tableau server, you have an opportunity to Give it a name and, and be pretty specific about where it gets placed. So let's take this and put it in a PCC folder. And as you notice from the rest of the screen, you start to see some other things that we can do in terms of describing who's allowed to interact with it, et cetera. And maybe that's it. Maybe that's maybe that's all I do as the as as the architect. So the the next person comes along, a completely different individual who wants to go and produce some visualizations of some data. So this person doesn't want to have to figure out how to get reconnected to all these different tables and join in correctly and build hierarchies. They, they don't know and they don't care about any of that. What they do, rather than connecting directly to a data source, is they connect to Tableau Server. And they ask Tableau Server to present to them a list of data sources that they're permitted to connect to. Here's one that was published by Pat just a moment ago. And so now as a, as a consumer, I have access to all that metadata that was produced on my behalf. You'll notice a little bit of a difference in the icon up here. This is Tableau's way of trying to tell me that I'm not looking at a, a, a data source that's connecting directly to SQL or directly to Oracle. I'm querying via Tableau Server. I'm using a data source that has been prepared by somebody else and put inside Tableau Server for my use. So let's uh, let's go set something up that can be um, can be nice and obvious for us to play with later. Let's maybe we do a, a visualization by, by country or by city that um, that represents something about the, the, the revenue that we're producing. So my, my goal here isn't to try and teach you how to do anything in particular in Tableau Desktop. It's more to talk about this data server and how the interplay works. But I think it would be beneficial to do so with the use of, of some kind of a visualization along the way. So here we go. We'll stick with we'll stick with this. And we'll build a quick dashboard that 
helps us understand what the profit margin is for various places where we do business in Europe. All right. And let's uh, let's see where we go with this. We'll, we'll go ahead and take this one step further. We'll set this up because we've got an action bubble between these guys. Great stuff. Everybody knows how to do that with Capital Desktop. That's assumed knowledge for this session. What have I done? I've connected to a data server, data vault. I've produced a visualization, and I can now publish this off the Tableau server. Um, take note of the value for some of these um, margin figures that we see down here. They're kind of running at, well, now they're running up to about 70 percent, but when we look at this at the highest level, they run somewhere between about 6 and 20 percent. So if we fiddle with the formula later, well, if we take note of these values, we'll, we'll see some changes that will appear. Let's let's take this visualization and, and publish it to Tableau Server. So I'm not publishing the metadata now, I'm actually publishing a proper workbook. Oh, come on. And we'll put this guy up on the server. Come on. All right. So Tableau is finished publishing this back to the server. And we're done. Let's uh, let's take one final look at this. Let's look at this from the perspective of one of the end users out, out in the region that they might be interested in this. Aaron's one of our uh, one of our managers. Aaron logs on to Tableau. Aaron sees the visualization that was produced just a couple of moments ago. And Aaron opens it up and interacts with it, sees all of the things that we've, we've, we've done with, with Tableau. So now it's time to start talking a little bit more about what it is that we can do with this now that we've created it. We've created this one single set of metadata, we've produced some visualizations on it, and we've used it. So we've played three different roles. We looked at this from the perspective of three different people. What would happen if we decided that we needed to change one of the formulas? That formula that calculates the, the, the ratio, for example, the profit margin. Maybe we got it wrong, and we need to change it, and we want that change to affect everybody that happens to use this data connection. So we can promote some consistency, right, to solve the problem of making sure that things get done consistently across the organization. Well, the person who created that data source was someone named Pat. So Pat's going to log in. And Pat is interested in getting a hold of that data source that we created just a moment ago and downloading it and doing something like this. So we'll, uh, we'll do a couple of different things with this. Maybe the first thing that we want to do with this is we want to change this so that Pat is producing the right profit margin figure. And just for, for lack of a better example, we'll just hard plug a number in here, just so that you see that there's a change to this change to this figure. But there's another kind of important thing that we might want to start to do and to talk about, and that is dealing with security. Right? Maybe Aaron should only see the countries in Europe that Aaron managed. Or maybe Chris can only see only the countries that Chris manages. If you look at this data, there happens to be an association between usernames and countries. And I can use this to my advantage. I can create a way to dynamically filter the data so that the person who's logged on gets compared against the name of one of these countries. And we either do or don't get to result that. So I'll show you what that looks like. If we create another quick calculated field, we'll call this a security filter. It's a real simple thing. All I'm going to do is ask a really simple question. Is the manager, that's this column coming from the database, it's coming from an entitlement statement in my database, is that manager's logon name the same as the username that we capture when we log on to Tableau? So this is just a formula that Tableau creates for us automatically. Whenever somebody logs on, they have a username. And I'm asking a really simple yes, no, true, false question. Are these two things the same, yes or no? If we look at that right now, you'll see that it's pretty much false for everybody. 
because I actually have not logged on to Tableau Server at the moment. So if we do that, if we go sign in as a user, sign as Pat, just to show you what this looks like. Now all of a sudden we see a bunch of rows that happen to be true because Pat manages all of these countries and then false for everybody else because they're not managing these countries. So if I take that filter and apply that to the metadata, it then becomes inserted into everybody's queries dynamically. The end users never even know what's happening. So it's a way to make sure that the right people get the data that they need and nothing more than the data. To do that, let's just go edit our, app, not the right place. Let's go edit what we call a data source filter. And what I'm going to do is take this little thing that we created called a security filter and say, only give me the rows where that security filter happens to be true. And lo and behold, I get fewer things coming back from the database. It's because that filter is now getting applied dynamically behind the scenes as a user I don't have to explicitly put anything on this filter shell. Instead, what I'm doing is I'm taking that formula that we created and I'm inserting it as a, what we call a data source filter. It sort of, it gets applied to any query that goes from this data source back to SQL Server. So the users will only get the data that they're off of, see? So there are two changes to this data source, right? I, I, I fiddled around with one of the formulas so that it gives me some different results. And I put in a, a user filter here that makes sure that the right people only see the right data. If I take this and publish it back to the server, let me just take this and overwrite the existing one. And let's see what that does for us. What does it do for us if we log on as um we got? We'll get Aaron for a second. Let's see how, how how she looks. So if Aaron logs into this visualization, Aaron doesn't get quite what I was hoping she would get. We'd cache some results. I just needed to override the task that was being managed by Tableau, but from this point forward, whenever Erin logs on, she's just going to see the things that are in France because that's the country that she happens to manage. And you'll notice that clearly that formula that I had made changes to obviously propagated through this workbook. So the, the, the message behind this is that um, I'm creating one centrally managed copy of the semantic that they're driving this workbook, but potentially dozens of other workbooks. So every single person that's using one of these workbooks is going to be subject to the same sets of rules, the same sets of formulas, the same hierarchies, the same role level security rules. And none of the end users have to worry about this. It just happens for them automatically without them doing anything wrong, anything special. There's two more things that we'll talk about with respect to uh, data server. One of them was, was a comment that I made earlier around minimizing the number of extracts that, that you have inside an organization. And then the other one is around enabling some, some, some new workflows that previously hadn't been available inside Tableau. New things like being able to create new workbooks and new visualizations from scratch inside a browser as opposed to starting inside Tableau desktop. So let's do this. Let's go log in again as Pat. That's the person who created this data source to begin with. And so we will work with Pat one more time to look at this data source. And I want to make one quick change to it. Right now, this data source is connecting directly to SQL Server. But suppose this is a, a big, clunky Oracle database that just logs along and takes forever to respond. We could lift the data out of Oracle and drop it into Tableau's extract engine. And that extract engine can then take the data and post it on Tableau server. And it turns out that's a really, really easy thing to do by just clicking through 
the options to physically extract the data. I've now produced an extract of this data set. So when an end user does some kind of a query asking for some type of some, some information, the extract itself um, is providing the response, not the uh, uh, not the back backend SQL Server. So let's take this data source and publish it one final time to Pablo Server. The only thing I've changed in this case is the fact that this data source now has an extract associated with it. And as a result of it now having an extract associated with it, Tableau says, well, would you like me to refresh this extract for you on sometime or another? And I could say, yeah, you know what? I'd like on the end of every month for this extract to get some new data poured into it. So off we go, producing a new copy of this extract once a month, and the job's done. That will be completely transparent to the end user. They won't notice, apart from the fact that queries are gonna happen more quickly, they won't notice that change that you've just made. In the case of one of my customers in the United States, that simple thing that I just did saved them several hundred thousand dollars because they didn't have to expand the capacity of their backend data warehouse. Their backend data warehouse was completely overwhelmed with too many queries. So what we did is we built one or two simple extracts that provided answers for dozens of different ad hoc users. And we put the extracts inside Tableau server. And as a consequence, the customer did not have to go and invest in additional capacity for their backend data models. So yes, it's a really, really simple thing to do, but don't lose sight of the fact that it does some amazing things in terms of um, changing the economics for this for a lot of customers. The last thing to talk about here, the last thing to go through might be, uh, let's do this, let's pick on Chris. We'll take a look at what this would look like if I wanted to ask some new questions that had never before been conceived of. So everything that we've done so far as an end user going through a browser has all been about finding an existing workbook and opening it up and, and interacting with it. But it turns out that assuming I'm giving people the right permissions, they can themselves work with one of these data sources to answer some of their own brand new questions independently. So Chris might, for example, be interested in trying to understand something geographically. And so we take country and drag it out. It turns out the Chris only manages Belgium. All right, well maybe we want to do something down at the day level. So this is my way of proving to you that that data level, that row level security works even when you're creating new artifacts. It doesn't just work when you're looking at existing artifacts. The data server itself is providing for the row level security and making sure that people only see the data that they should be seeing. So, so we could keep carrying on from here, building any kind of a workbook that you wanted to build, any kind of visualization that you want. There's really two key points to this. Number one, I can do this and I can do it inside a browser. I don't necessarily have to deploy copies of Tableau desktop everywhere. And number two, although this gets opened up to a large number of users, it can be configured to respect the security rules you have inside the database. So those were several little individual demonstrations all focused on trying to resolve some of the uh, some of these issues that we talked about at the beginning of the presentation. We talked about using the data server to present a, a pre-joined set of tables that have exactly the right metadata created for hierarchies and formulas, et cetera. And we talked a little bit about, we talked a little bit about how that cleans up um, all sorts of issues around explosion and proliferation of, of extracts and consistency with respect to semantically data the end users. There's just all kinds of good stuff that comes out of using um, the data server. So that just leaves really one question, which is what, what should you do next inside your organization? And first things first, go figure out for yourself whether or not the will work for you. Go take a look at our website. There's blog postings out there. There's online training videos that are available to help educate you about what the data server is and how it works. Um, do an audit of the workbooks that you have and try and figure out which of those workbooks are essentially asking the same question over and over and over again. 
and figure out for yourself whether or not some of those things can be done with a single data source versus one-to-one -one course correlation between data sources and workbooks. Once you figure that out, go build some of these data sources for yourself and then have your workbooks leverage those common data sources as opposed to the individual data sources that you probably have today. And communicate. Let everybody know that these things are available. Let them know that they can create some of their own new artifacts off of these common semantic models as opposed to reinventing the wheel for themselves every single time they get started. To help you along your way to figure all this stuff out, when you get back to your office, you can download these slides, and these slides will have those links, which will direct you to some specific training and, and blog articles that are, are relevant. And with that, I will thank you for taking time to listen.